There are many ways to improve yourself as an Identity 5 player, and I don't know and or can't remember a lot of the interactions for Identity 5. One thing that we can do though is ask other players. This will help us to improve and learn things about the game that we didn't know before. So what I did is I collected a few comments from some of my past videos that gave great tips and I decided to expand on them. So let's begin. This tip from Jaron Kurt is a really good comment and it's really worth a read. But I really want to focus on the first tip that he gives and then connect it to some of the later ones that he gives in the same comment. His first tip is don't decode together. There are many reasons for doing this. First of all, by decoding together, you are not decoding multiple ciphers. So by doing the maths, you're actually decoding less ciphers in total. You may finish that cipher a little bit sooner, but that time that you spent decoding one cipher together, you could have completed nearly two ciphers. Also, you're making a bigger target for the hunter or giving the hunter at least more options. It is okay to decode together in the later game, but in the early game, it's a really good idea just to decode your cipher on your own. If somebody comes over to your cipher, you either move on to a different cipher so that person can decode, or that person that just came to you needs to move to a different cipher. Now let's imagine that the hunter finds another survivor in your team, and he is chasing them. Your teammate now has to kite. What do you do? One thing you shouldn't do is debate if you should go and help or not. What you should do is you should focus on decoding. Too often do I see teammates debating whether they should try and help their teammate kite or if they should continue decoding or do something else. Just focus on decoding. Your teammate is trying to buy you as a team as much time as possible by kiting. So please use that time wisely and decode the ciphers so that their kite was not useless. And if you're the person who is kiting, then you should really try to avoid kiting near ciphers where your teammates are decoding. By bringing the hunter near to a decoding cipher, you're actually pushing your friend or your teammate off of that cipher, maybe forcing them to go and start a new cipher somewhere else. This can waste a lot of time and can even make decoding that first cipher they were decoding kind of pointless. In general, try and avoid or die far away from other people's ciphers. If you're not playing in voice chat, then one thing you should be paying attention when you're kiting is where people are pinging their percentage. You can see this on the minimap. So try and avoid going in those areas. This comment by Blueberry Spills Inc. is an addition to a tip that I gave in one of my previous videos. I mentioned that it's important not to rescue someone from a chair immediately because it gives you as a team more time to decode ciphers. I also mentioned that there are a few hunters where you might want to consider rescuing immediately from. Blueberry gave us a great list of those hunters. The first hunter we have is Hellember. The more time that you give him at the chair, the more rage he builds up. The rage is what he can give to one of his puppets or to make an ember and this means that he can give them more autonomy for a longer period of time, making it very difficult to rescue and also making it very difficult later in the game. Feaster is another one. Since the more time he spends near a survivor, he builds up more tentacles. You don't want to give him more tentacles because that means he has more anti-kiting later in the game. Also, he can set up a great defense with his tentacles around the chair, making it very, very difficult to rescue. Another hunter is Guard26. The more time you give him, the better defense he can set up at the chair, making it that the survivor that tries to rescue may even get knocked down before they get to the chair. One hunter that's debatable if you should rescue sooner or later from is Photographer. If you can rescue before he gets to a camera, that means you don't have to deal with rescuing in the mirror world as well. If the photographer takes a photo while that person is on the chair, and then you rescue, and you don't rescue the copy, then the person who was rescued will still be down at the end of the photo world. This could be a bit problematic, even if they hadn't been hit after being rescued. Some more interesting interactions that you need to know for Identity 5 can be found in the comments by Ibai Fernandez and Wu Chang's Umbrella's comments. Ibai says that if someone is playing prisoner and they connect to your cipher, don't touch the gauge. Leave the gauge at 0%. Most of the time when Prisoner is connected to your cipher, he is trying to transfer some of his decoding to your cipher. Now if you try and send some of your decoding to his cipher, then it counteracts it and it was pointless. The only time you should touch that gauge if you are connected to the cipher and you're not Prisoner is if nobody is on the other end. You can know this either in voice chat or by pings and also by paying attention to how fast the other cipher is moving. If it is not moving at all, then you should definitely turn it up 
by a certain amount. Wu Chang's umbrella points out how you can deal with photographer's 0.75 damage. In one of my previous videos, I mentioned how you shouldn't bother to try and heal yourself because this will use up a lot of time and it's pointless because you still are one hit away. But there is a way of circumventing this. If you heal your real self, while photo world is activated, bringing yourself down to 0.25 health, and you don't touch your mirror copy in the mirror world, when the photo world ends, you will take 0.25 damage. This will bring you up to 0.5 health, meaning that you are one heal away from being at full health. This is very time consuming though, because you would need to heal yourself twice. Well, I mean, somebody else would have to heal you, so this would take up two healings worth of time, so it might not be worth it, but it may be worth considering in a desperate situation. This second comment by Jaren Kurt is also something that I had heard about, but didn't really know or hadn't really seen. I also didn't think it was possible, but after some testing, I found out that it's completely true. Sometimes when you're playing as a hunter, a survivor who's been knocked down may crawl between a pallet, hoping that their teammate might come over and pallet stun you while you're in the picking up animation. This can be a bit of a bit stressful for a hunter because they're too scared to pick up the survivor because they might drop them again instantly because of the pallet stun. You can avoid this completely with Jaren Kurt's trick. By walking up to the survivor and walking past them slightly and delaying pressing the pick up button, what will happen is that you will pick them up away from the pallet. The survivor will be moved slightly away from the pallet, meaning that you are clear from the pallet and you won't get pallet stunned. This does take a little bit of practice, but it really does work and it's very effective. This comment by ALMA points out something that beginner players and even people who've been playing for a while may struggle with. And that is the numerous amount of symbols in Identity 5. Some of them indicate status conditions, some of them indicate abilities being activated. What I will do here is I will list some of the most notable symbols in the game that survivors and hunters use. When there is a pink mist surrounding the avatar of one of the survivors, this means they have used perfume. It means that if they get hit or if they decide to, if they decide to press the button again, they will teleport back to where they first activated that perfume. If there is a light green circle around an avatar of a character, this means that Seer has used an owl on them and they are protected from one hit. This slowly increasing yellow bar is where Mercenary has been hit. He doesn't take the damage automatically, he really has a delayed hit. So when the bar gets to the yellow line, this means that he will take the full damage. This blue line around the avatar means that that person has a shield. Usually you see this with Gardener's bubble. The shield will protect them from one hit. This coffin symbol means that this survivor has been chosen by Embalmer to be put in his coffin. If this person gets knocked down or put on a chair, Embalmer can choose to bring them back to his coffin instead of needing to rescue them from the chair. Beware though, because the hunter can also see who has been coffined. These white lines counting down on either side of an avatar means that this person has taken a drink from Barmaid. After this timer has finished, this person will heal 0.5. But if they get hit during this time, they will lose this heal. This symbol means that the person is underground and they have used a shovel. You will see this with Gravekeeper when he has dug underground and is in the underground state. He has a one hit protection and he also moves a little bit faster. The boar symbol means that Wadling is riding his boar. If the boar is red, this means that the boar has been hit. Also, something else that's connected to Wadling is if you see these wavy lines on either side of your screen, this means Wadling has activated his ability that means that hunters cannot use Tinnitus. Tinnitus is the is one of the personas that a hunter will take and is very typical for a hunter to take that tells them when a survivor is near them. When you see these lines on either side of the screen, this has negated this ability for a short period of time. The cocoon symbol means that the survivor has not been chaired but has been wrapped in a cocoon. This happens with Soul Weaver. This effectively is the same as being chaired but they don't need to put you on a chair, you are just wrapped up in a cocoon. Be careful though, because if you move or try to wiggle around while you're in the cocoon, this will kill you faster. This red pulsing when you are knocked down is an effect that Percy has. This means that you are bleeding out faster. At the moment, this is only something that Undead has. The last tips we have are from Gothic Bowie and Ice the Third. These tips are connected to kiting. Don't vault when a hunter is near you. You want to avoid vaulting when a hunter is really near you because you can get terror shocked. If you can, it is worth taking one hit instead of taking the double hit from the Terror Shock and then vaulting the window or the pallet. But 
it may be a good idea to try and vault if the hunter is near you and you know you're going to get hit if you are only half health and you know you're going to get knocked down anyway. This will delay the hunter since they will need to either go around the building or the structure or go through the window. This will delay them by a couple of seconds. In one of my videos, I said that it's a good idea not to throw down pallets too early, but there are a couple of exceptions. If you need to transition to an area and you know that the hunter will catch you before you get to this other area, then it may be a good idea to drop a pallet to force the hunter to break it. Whilst they are, they are in the breaking animation, you can then transition to a new area. Also, it may be a good idea if you need if you really need to get to a window or to a pallet that's near you, but you know that the hunter would beat you there, so you drop the pallet so that they have to break it or go around, giving you enough time to get to a window or a pallet or some other escape route. These tips have been very useful and there are some tips that I didn't even know. If you have any more tips that you think that the Identity 5 community needs to know or you think that I don't know or somebody else who is a beginner might not know, then please write them down in the comments below. If you found this video useful, then please give it a like and subscribe if you're interested in knowing some tips, some tricks, and maybe some secret information or information you didn't know about Identity 5. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.